Hello, everybody. My name is Andrew Nevins, and I am very happy to welcome you to Abraleen Alvu Linguists Online. Uh, I'm here today with Elon Drescher. Uh, I am here on behalf of Fia Hijota Libras and other programs. I hope that now some of you who have been watching the tele show on Netflix, Deaf You, can see uh, a local equivalent. And I'm very happy because, in fact, Elon's work touches on so many issues related to, I think, what all of us think about. The, one of the uh, libraries and programs that I run is contrastive units in language. And that's, uh, in a sense, also geared to thinking about the contrastiveness of or allophonics or of, of even units like the pinky in sign language these days. I owe a great intellectual debt to Elon Drescher, who I even think possibly might have been, I'll never, the review first journal paper I ever submitted to a journal. So, you know, I may have a very, very long relationship with him, even longer than either of us officially know. But Elon has been at the fore of my mind. We had a debate in Leiden, the Netherlands, in 2011 or 12. We ended up authoring a paper on the Orichen language, a minority language of China, and its uh, its um, repercussions for the theory of vowel harmony. His work on contrast continues to be relevant for me today, uh, especially in tracing some of the historical foundations of it as I teach courses on the uh, history of linguistic theory and linguistic thought. And although I think he initially retired, continues to be ex always has new ideas so I'm very eager to hear what has today as part of this series. Now I want to remind you that the Abra Linguists Online series is an initiative of Abra Lin, the Brazilian Linguistics Association, and it has the specific purpose to give students and like yourselves who are watching free access, free access to state-of-the-art discussions on some of the most diverse topics related to the study of human language. So. You know, if this is the first one you've tuned I highly encourage you to look at many of them. It's been an incredible range of topics, and uh, Abin, and in particular me, who has organized it, have been tireless in their efforts. So we can give them a virtual round of applause, virtual round of applause for our speaker today, Elon Drescher. I want everyone that my role as moderator lurk chat window and... Um, uh, funnel, channel, uh, canalize uh, your questions and ideas that pop up in real time in the chat window to questions we can ask during the discussion period. So with no further ado, Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, okay, I'd like to thank uh, Andrew for the introduction and thanks very much to Abralin for putting on this uh, terrific series. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be part of it. So in this talk, I will present a brief introduction to a theory of contrastive hierarchies in uh, phonology. Uh, I start from the assumption that phonology is about contrast. Without contrast, there is no phonology, only phonetics or the physics of speech. The question which contrast of hierarchy theory addresses is how contrast should be incorporated into phonological theory. Contrast of hierarchy theory is built on essentially two ideas. The first idea is that phonological primes, in my case, binary features, are computed hierarchically with the choice and ordering of the primes being language particular. The second hypothesis is that only contrastive primes are computed uh, by the phonology. Non-contrastive features can be added, for example, by enhancement in a post-phonological component. I will show how the theory has been applied to vowel reduction in Brazilian Portuguese and the acquisition of its vowel system. I will then show how the West Germanic vowel system provides a challenging empirical test of the theory 
And uh, spoiler alert, the theory will pass the test. Uh, before getting to that, in the first part of the talk, I will show that the central ideas of contrastive hierarchy theory in one form or another have been hiding in plain sight at the center of the history of phonology. I will begin with Henry Sweet at the dawn of modern phonology. Uh, most directly though, the theory adapts proposals by Roman Jakobson and N.S. Trubetskoy to the generative framework of Noam Chomsky and Morris Halley. The structure and progress of the talk will be indicated in this panel. So to begin, according to Daniel Jones, Henry Sweet was the first to distinguish a detailed phonetic transcription, what he called narrow romic, from a phonemic transcription suitable to an individual language, what he called broad romic. For example, the vowels in the English words bait and bet differ in three ways. The vowel in bait is longer and tenser than in bet and is a diphthong, whereas the vowel in bet is a monophthong. An accurate phonetic transcription would indicate all these distinctions. In the current notation of the International Phonetic Alphabet, the IPA, they are transcribed as shown. Now these three differences, however, are not independent. If we recombine the various properties to create new vowels as shown, uh, would not result in a new word distinct from both bait and bet, but would be heard as some perhaps odd sounding variant of one of these words. Sweet writes, we may lay down as a general rule that only those distinctions of sound required to be symbolized in any one language, which are independently significant. And he goes on, if two criteria of significance are inseparably associated, such as quantity and narrowness or wideness, that is tenseness or laxness, we only need indicate one of them. Sweet proposes that in broad transcription, the sound A should be transcribed EI, or equivalently EJ, and E should be transcribed as the letter E. So of the three differences in the vowels, he chooses the presence of the off glide J as being significant, ignoring both the quantity, that is the length, and the tenseness or laxness. And moreover, he gives us the rationale for his choice. He observes the narrowness of all English vowels is uncertain, especially E and A. Uh, that is, uh, vowels can vary in the degree to which they are tense or lax without essentially changing the identity of the vowel as long as other properties do not change. Similarly, he finds that originally short vowels can be lengthened and yet kept quite distinct from the original longs. That is, uh, bet can be lengthened to bet or bed even without passing into bait. And bait can be shortened to bait without being perceived as being bet. So while tenseness and length can be altered without changing one phoneme into another, presumably the same is not the case for the third distinguishing property. If you add a glide to the vowel in bet or remove it from bait, that could cause the resulting vowel to be perceived as having changed category. So we can conclude from his discussion that Sweet's analysis posits that the contrastive properties of both the vowels in bait and bet are that they are mid and front with no contrastive specification for tenseness or quantity. The difference in the two resides in the addition of a second segment to the vowel in bait. Now, Sweet did not propose a method for computing contrastive properties, nor did he consistently attempt to identify what the contrastive properties are for every segment. However, we can see in his work, the ideas that first only contrastive properties need be transcribed. And these properties can be identified by observing how sounds function in a language. Uh, the further development of these ideas and their connection with feature hierarchies came some years later in the work of the Prague School linguists, notably N.S. Trubetskoy and Roman Jakobson. 
And as Trubetskoy's Grundzüge der Phonologie um, is notable for its insights into the nature of contrast. An important notion is phonemic content. And he writes, by phonemic content, we understand all phonologically distinctive properties of a phoneme. Each phoneme has a definable phonemic content only because the system of distinctive oppositions shows a definite order or structure. And continuing to quote him, the content of a phoneme depends on what position this phoneme takes in the given phonemic system. So these remarks suggest that the phonemic content of a phoneme, that is the set of its contrastive properties, ought to derive from its position in the system of distinctive oppositions. So we need a way to determine a phoneme's position in the system of oppositions before we have determined its distinctive properties. Now, Trubetskoy does not explicitly show us how to do that. However, a way of providing an order or a structure to the system of contrasts is via the hierarchical branching trees that became prominent later in the work of Jakobsen. Now, feature hierarchies are already implicit in Trubetskoy's book. Consider his discussion of the Latin vowel system. He observes that in Latin, as in many five vowel systems, the low vowel does not participate in tonality contrasts. Tonality refers to backness or lip rounding, that is properties that affect the second formant. That is, the low vowel a ah is characterized only by its height. In our terms, it is assigned only the feature plus low. But how can we prevent a ah from receiving other features? Well, we can do it if we assign contrastive features in an order in a hierarchy. So in order to exclude a ah from receiving other features, it's necessary to order low at the top of the feature hierarchy. This has the effect of separating a ah from all the other vowels. Since a ah is now already uniquely distinguished, it will receive no further features. What the other two or maybe three features are depends on the evidence from the language. Common vowel, five vowel systems use the features back or round and high. Now the notion of a feature hierarchy is only implicit in Trubetskoy's discussion of Latin. Uh, I invoke a feature hierarchy as a way to make sense of his analysis. In the case of Palabian, however, Trubetskoy explicitly refers to a hierarchy. He observes that a certain hierarchy existed in the vowel system of Palabian, whereby the contrast between front and back vowels is higher than the contrast between rounded and unrounded vowels. Now, another important insight of Trubetskoy's is contained in a 1936 article addressed to psychologists and philosophers, where he writes, the correct classification of an opposition depends on one's point of view, but it is neither subjective nor arbitrary, for the point of view is implied by the system. Well, what does this mean? To say that the correct classification depends on one's point of view means that phonological contrasts can vary from one language to another, and they cannot be determined simply by inspecting an inventory. Now we've seen in Latin that the low vowel a ah is set apart from the other vowels in Trubetskoy's analysis, but this is not the only way to draw the contrasts in a five vowel system. It's possible, for example, to group a ah with the other minus round vowels. Trubetskoy proposes that Archie, a language of central Dagestan, has a vowel system that is divided in this manner. He says that because of how the sounds behave. He observes that a consonantal rounding contrast is neutralized before and after the rounded vowels u and o, which contrast these vowels with the unrounded e, a, and a. Ah. He goes on, this means that all vowels are divided into rounded and unrounded vowels, while the back or front position of the tongue proves irrelevant. 
Now, this analysis corresponds to ordering the feature round first at the top, dividing the vowels into two groups, the minus round ones and the plus round ones. Further distinctions are then made by other features, and the tree here shows one possible uh, hierarchy. In Japanese, Trubetskoy argues that neutralization of the opposition between palatalized and non-palatalized consonants before E and A shows that these vowels are put into opposition with the other vowels. The governing opposition is that between front and back vowels, lip rounding being irrelevant, he writes. So this analysis corresponds to ordering a feature front first. And the rest of the tree I have adapted, adopted from uh, Here I Am 2003. So these feature trees are implicit in Trubetskoy, but they become explicit in the work of Roman Jakobsen and his collaborators. And I turn to that now. Jakobsen's Kindersprache in 1941 advances the notion that contrasts are crucial in phonological acquisition and that they develop in a hierarchical order. In particular, he proposes that learners begin with broad contrasts that are split by stages into progressively finer ones. The acquisition of vowel systems that he sets out and uh, also in Jakobsen and Halley 1956, which is kind of a sequel, uh, follows this schema. At the first stage, there is only one vowel. As there are no contrasts, we can simply designate it V, capital V. Now, Jakobsen and Halley write that this lone vowel is the maximally open vowel A, which they call the optimal vowel, the vowliest vowel. But we don't need to be that specific. We can understand this to be a default value or a typical but not obligatory instantiation. In the next stage, it's proposed that the single vowel splits into a, a high vowel, which is typically E, he calls it narrow, and a wide or a low vowel, which is typically A. Uh, I will continue to understand these values as defaults. In the next stage, the narrow vowel, the high one, splits into a palatal or front vowel, and a velar back or round vowel, which is again, typically U. Now, so we have E, A, U. But after the first two stages, Jakobsen and Halley allow variation in the order of acquisition of vowel contrast. The wide branch can be expanded to parallel the narrow one, or the narrow vowels can develop a rounding contrast in one or both branches. Continuing in this way, we will arrive at a complete inventory of the phonemes in a language, with each phoneme assigned a set of contrastive properties or features that distinguish it from every other one. And this approach has two notable characteristics that we want to underline. First, again, only contrastive features are assigned to each phoneme, and they are assigned hierarchically in a way that can be represented by a branching tree. In the sound pattern of Russian or SPR, Morris Halley makes an argument on behalf of branching trees. This is actually the first such argument that I have found in the literature. He argues that feature specification by a branching tree is the only way that segments can be kept properly distinct. Specifically, Halley proposed that phonemes must meet the distinctness condition. The distinctness condition states, segment type A will be said to be different from segment type B if and only if at least one feature which is phonemic in both has a different value in A than in B. That is, it has a plus in the former and minus in the latter or vice versa. Now this formulation is designed to disallow contrasts involving a zero value or lack of a specification of a feature. So consider the typical sub-inventory PBM uh, as shown here, and suppose that we characterize it in terms of two binary features, voiced and nasal. Now in terms of full specifications, P is minus voiced, 
minus nasal, B is plus voiced minus nasal, and M is plus voiced plus nasal. Now, which of these features is contrastive? Uh, many people reason as follows. We observe that P and B are distinguished only by voiced. So these specifications must be contrastive. Similarly, B and M are distinguished only by nasal. So these specifications must also be contrastive. But what about the other ones that we have encircled? Those specifications are predictable from the circled one because P is the only minus voiced phoneme in this inventory. Its specification for nasal is predictable, hence redundant. We can write a rule or a constraint. We can say if you are minus voiced, then you will be minus nasal. Similarly, M is the only plus nasal phoneme. So its specification for voiced is redundant. If plus nasal, then predictably plus voiced. Now this is a still popular way of thinking about contrastive specifications. And we can call it the minimal difference approach. According to minimal difference, a feature is only contrastive in a segment if it is the only feature that distinguishes that segment from another one. But according to Halley's distinctness condition, P is not different from M in this set of specifications. Where one has a feature, the other has nothing. Therefore, according to Halley, these specifications are not properly contrasted. They violate the distinctness condition because no feature hierarchy can yield this result. So if we order voiced over nasal, we generate an extra specification on M. If we order nasal over voiced, we generate an extra specification on P. Either of those uh, ways uh, of doing it is properly contrasted. And note that in a hierarchical approach, a contrastive feature does not have to be necessarily unpredictable. Therefore, according to sound pattern of Russian, to ensure that all the phonemes of a language are distinct from one another, it is necessary that their feature specifications must be generable by a branching tree. Now, I believe that Halley's argument is correct, as was demonstrated by Arcangeli, 1988, and in more detail in my book, the minimal difference approach often fails to yield any intelligible set of specifications. It's simply the wrong theory of contrast. Conceptually, the main flaw of minimal difference is its failure to recognize that contrastive relations in an inventory exist not just between pairs of segments, but also between groups of segments at different levels of the hierarchy. So there is a sense in which contrast is indeed minimal, almost by definition. But this is true only when it's viewed in hierarchical layers and not in pairwise comparisons. Uh, so it's ironic that while the sound pattern of Russian contains this original argument on behalf of branching trees, at the same time, its analysis of Russian contributed to undermining the whole notion of contrastive specification, which we uh, discuss in a forthcoming paper. Uh, because of that, and due also to the arguments by Leitner and Stanley, under specification was abandoned altogether in Chomsky and Halley's The Sound Pattern of English, or SPE, along with the branching trees. Again, I've discussed this at some length. The result was that language particular feature contrast did not play a role in the theory of generative grammar that developed from SPE. Uh, though I depart from SPE with respect to their views on contrast, uh, Chomsky and Halley provide the broad generative framework and cognitive approach to phonology that I will assume in the theory of contrast uh, to which I now turn. So as a theory of phonological representations, 
branching trees were revived under other names by Clements and independently at the University of Toronto, where they are called contrastive feature hierarchies. It is the latter approach I will be presenting here. It has gone under various names, uh, modified contrastive specification or Toronto School phonology or contrast and enhancement theory. I call it uh, contrastive hierarchy theory. Uh, I don't claim there's any standard version of this theory. I will present it the way uh, I understand it. So the first major building block of our theory, which we've already seen, is that contrasts are computed hierarchically by ordered features that can be expressed as a branching tree. Branching trees are generated by the successive division algorithm, which informally says, assign contrastive features by successively dividing the inventory until every phoneme has been distinguished. Well, we need criteria for how to order and select the features. Phonetics is clearly important in that the selected features must be consistent with the phonetic properties of the phonemes. For example, a contrast between E and A ah would most likely involve a height feature like low or high, although other choices are possible, for example, front or tongue root. Uh, of course, the contrastive specification of a phoneme could sometimes deviate from the surface phonetics. In some dialects of Inuktitut, for example, an underlying contrast exists between E and schwa, which is neutralized at the surface, so that both E and schwa are phonetically realized as E. In this case, E and schwa would still be distinguished by a contrastive feature, even though their surface phonetics are identical. So as the above example shows, the way a sound patterns can override its phonetics as Sapir showed a long time ago. Thus, we consider as most fundamental that features should be selected and ordered so as to reflect the phonological activity in a language where activity is defined as follows. And I've adapted this from uh, Nick Clements. A feature can be said to be active if it plays a role in the phonological computation. That is, if it is required for the expression of phonological regularities in a language, including both static phonotactic patterns and patterns of alternation. The second major tenet of this theory have been, has been formulated by Daniel Hall as the contrastivist hypothesis, which says the phonological component of a language L operates only on those features which are necessary to distinguish the phonemes of L from one another. That is, only contrastive features can be phonologically active. Now, if this hypothesis is correct, it follows as a corollary that if a feature is phonologically active, then it must by hypothesis be contrastive. So on this hypothesis, underlying lexical representations consist only of contrastive specifications. And these representations form the input to the contrastive phonology, which is the domain in which the contrastivist hypothesis applies, meaning you only can have contrastive features there. Now, Stevens, Kaiser, and Kawasaki propose that feature contrast can be enhanced by other features with similar acoustic effects. Our hypothesis is that enhancement takes place after the contrastive phonology when further phonetic detail is specified. Example of enhancement, suppose we have a vowel that contrastively is plus back and minus low, like the circled vowel here. Well, that vowel can enhance these features by adding plus round to enhance plus back and adding plus high to enhance minus low. I designate enhancement features with green curly brackets. Now these enhancements are not necessary, however, in particular languages and other realizations uh, are possible. Uh, a further assumption is that features are binary and that every feature has a marked and unmarked value. I assume that markedness is language particular following uh, Karen Rice and Markiness accounts for asymmetries between the two values of a feature where these exist. 
For example, we expect that unmarked values serve as defaults and may be more or less inert. Now, Trubetskoy suggested that neutralization, the suspension of a contrast in certain positions, can have different types of outcomes. In the case of vowel, vowel reduction, for example, vowels that contrast in stress position might neutralize to the unmarked vowel when not stressed. In other cases, though, the reduced vowel cannot be phonetically equated with a particular stressed vowel. That is, neutralization is to a vowel that has a different representation from both the marked and unmarked stressed vowels. Contrastive hierarchy theory can elegantly represent both types of reduction, which arise in Brazilian Portuguese. So according to Barbosa and Albano, a São Paulo speaker had the stressed vowels shown below. They write that in pre-stressed position, the quality of the corresponding stressed vowel is rough, roughly preserved. But this is not the case for unstressed vowels in final position. Uh, SPAR 2012 proposes a contrastive hierarchy theory account of Brazilian Portuguese vowel reduction. I have modified his hierarchy to that proposed by Bone for the Paulista dialect. In pre-stressed position, there are no ATR contrasts under the minus high nodes that are numbered three below. Spar proposes that these nodes are interpreted as archiphonemes a la Trubetskoy. The new representations receive their own phonetic interpretations. In this southeastern dialect, they are realized as O and A. Uh, Brazilian Portuguese dialects differ as to whether OA or OE are the results of neutralization. And this is discussed by Andrew uh, in the paper. Uh, broadly speaking, southeastern dialects have the plus ATR OA and northeastern dialects reduced to minus ATR OA. Under specification allows in Nevin's terms for flexibility of interpretation that allows either plus or minus ATR to be less marked. In unstressed final position, the contrasts under the nodes numbered two are suppressed and the segments under these nodes receive distinct phonetic interpretations as u and i. In this new set of contrasts, the segment under node one also receives a distinct phonetic interpretation a. Now, Milky and Samuels have argued that phonological features are not innate, but rather emerge in the course of acquisition. They argue that innate features are too specific and no single set of proposed features works in all cases. But if features are not innate, what compels them to emerge? We need to explain why features inevitably emerge and why they have the properties that they do. Contrastive hierarchy theory provides an answer to this question. Learners must arrive at a set of hierarchically ordered contrastive features. An inventory of three phonemes allows exactly two contrastive features. And here I give two variants of the feature tree that's possible, which differ in how the marked features are distributed. A four phoneme inventory can have a minimum of two features and a maximum of three. In general, the number of features required by an inventory of n elements will fall in the following ranges. The minimum number is the smallest integer greater than or equal to the base two log of n. The maximum number of features is equal to n minus one. The minimum number of features goes up very slowly as phonemes are added, and the upper limit rises with n. However, systems that approach the upper limit are extremely uneconomical. At the max limit, each new contrast uses a unique feature unshared by any other phonemes. Uh, thus, the contrastive hierarchy and the contrastivist hypothesis 
account for why phonological systems resemble each other in terms of representations without requiring individual features to be innate. On this view, the concept of a contrastive hierarchy is an innate part of universal grammar and is the glue that binds phonological representations and makes them appear similar from one language to another. Uh, now, branching trees uh, did not disappear completely from phonology. They continued to be used in child language studies for they are a natural way to describe developing phonological inventories. More recently, Graziella Bohn uh, presented a uh, contrastive hierarchy analysis of the acquisition of the Brazilian Portuguese vowel system by three children. The tree below again shows the Brazilian Portuguese vowels in the Paulista dialect in stressed position. The hierarchy is back over low, over high, over ATR. Bone motivates this hierarchy based on the patterns of activity in this dialect. Now, child L seems to be a perfect Jacobsonian. The first vowel is A and the next one is E. But contrary to Jacobson, this is not really a height contrast. It looks like one, but Bone observes that substitution patterns suggest rather that it is a back contrast, which happens to be the top Brazilian Portuguese feature, which is again contrary to Jacobson's expectation. AM's, the second child, AM's first contrast is between A and E, not E. And Bone proposes that as with L, this also represents a backness contrast. So both L and AM make a first contrast that reflects the highest Brazilian Portuguese feature, which is back. Uh, are all Brazilian children this far-sighted? Well, apparently not. The third child, A, begins differently. A's first contrast is between A and O. And substitution patterns suggest that this is not a backness or roundness contrast, but a height contrast based on low. In the next stage, A acquires contrastive EAU. And at some point, A has to reorganize the feature hierarchy in order to arrive at the adult Brazilian Portuguese system, which has back over low. The ATR contrast is the last one to be acquired. Thus, we see that the three children take different routes in acquiring the vowel system. The order of acquisition of contrast is more variable than what Jakobsen allowed for. Nevertheless, the general idea that learners acquire contrast in a hierarchy is a fruitful way to model acquisition. So I would like to look now at Proto-Germanic, which is commonly assumed to have had the four short vowels E, A, A, and U. It also had long vowels, but these will not be relevant here. So you might be wondering why Proto-Germanic? Well, I picked the Proto-Germanic short vowel system to illustrate a contrastive hierarchy analysis for two reasons. The first reason is because its later evolution into West Germanic and then Old English raises some interesting diachronic issues that I would also like to look at shortly. And second, because all the ingredients of a contrastive hierarchy theory analysis have already been assembled by Antonsen in a paper in 1972. Elmer Antonsen was an American linguist and runologist who made many contributions to the study of Germanic phonology. As we have come to expect from our brief little history, his utilization of a contrastive feature hierarchy is only implicit. He never mentions it. However, his article is a nice illustration of contrastive hierarchy theory argumentation avant la lettre. So Antonsen proposes the feature specifications below for the short vowel system of Proto-Germanic. Notice that this system of specification shows a pattern of underspecification that is characteristic of a branching tree. 
The first feature applies to all the phonemes and the scopes of the remaining features get progressively smaller. Antonsen supports these specifications by citing patterns of phonological activity and loanword adaptation from Latin. So based on the evidence from descendant dialects, he assumes, or he posits that a had uh, allophones, which all have in common that they are plus low. Further, and this is important, there is evidence that E and U had lowered allophones before A, which again suggests that A had a plus low feature that could affect vowel height. And there is no evidence that A had any other active features. Uh, as the feature that distinguishes U from E and A, Antonsen chooses rounded. His reason is that all the allophones of U were rounded. Uh, well, nevertheless, I want to return shortly to this uh, aspect of his analysis. He finally, he observes that the contrast between E and A was neutralized in environments that affected tongue height. He argues that this supports distinguishing them by one feature, namely high. And he notes that the negative specifications of A are consistent with it being the only vowel which does not cause umlaut assimilations in a preceding root syllable. So as elegant as this analysis is, I will uh, follow the majority, including Lass, uh, Ringe, and Purnell and Ramey, in assuming that the feature that distinguishes EA from U is not rounded, but rather front. And my reason is that E could cause fronting of U which suggests that it had an active feature uh, plus front. With this amendment, the contrastive feature hierarchy for the Proto-Germanic short vowels looks like this. All the active features are contrastive as per the contrastivist hypothesis. Moreover, this analysis explains why certain vowels participate in certain processes and others do not. Uh, notice that the feature round plays no role in the contrastive phonology at this point. This aspect of the analysis will soon become very significant. So now turning to the diachrony, contrastive hierarchies have been fruitfully applied to phonological change in a variety of languages. And here's uh, some studies that utilize a version of contrastive hierarchy theory listed below. Maybe you can look at these later. Contrastive hierarchy theory can shed new light on a longstanding conundrum in the history of West Germanic. And this concerns the rule of E umlaut. And it illustrates how a post-lexical phonetic rule can become lexical and how an enhancement feature can become contrasted. It also provides a nice empirical test of what Andrew Nevins has called the oops, I need that problem. This problem refers to a situation where a non-contrastive feature is needed by the phonology. Now, according to the contrastivist hypothesis, this situation should not arise because only contrastive features should be active. So the oops, I need that problem indicates uh, a counterexample, well, an apparent counterexample to the contrastivist hypothesis. Okay, so recall that E and U had lowered allophones due to the influence of the plus low A. Remember, that's our reason for saying that A had the feature plus low. Now in West Germanic, uh, this development went so far that the lowered allophone of U developed into a new phoneme O. And this new phoneme filled a gap in the system and brought the minus front branch into symmetry with the plus front branch. Therefore, this new vowel did not require any change to the inherited Proto-Germanic short vowel feature hierarchy, which remains low over front over high. And notice again, the feature round is still not contrastive at this point. Now the rule of E umlaut began in early Germanic as a phonetic process that created fronted allophones of the back vowels when E or J followed. 
In the examples below, U and O are both fronted before an E, this is an unstressed E in the following syllable. Now, E umlaut crucially preserves the rounded nature of the front vowels. But remember, in our analysis of West Germanic, round is not contrastive. Uh-oh, is this an oops, I need that problem? No. For independent reasons, many commentators, beginning with Valentin Kiparsky in 1932 and Freeman Twedell, proposed that E umlaut began as a late phonetic rule and was not part of the contrastive phonology. Therefore, round is available as an enhancement feature at the point that U and O are fronted. Over time, however, there is evidence that E umlaut became a lexical rule. Already in Old English, the unstressed E trigger of E umlaut was either lowered after a light syllable, as in uvel, when E lowers to E, <clears throat> or it was deleted after a heavy syllable, as in hüt. These changes made E umlaut opaque on the surface. In many cases, the E umlaut trigger, that unstressed E, became unrecoverable to learners. So according to standard accounts, this led to the phonologization of the new uh, front rounded allophones as new phonemes. <clears throat> Again, an example is evil, whose underlying form is restructured from uvil to uvel, with no umlaut needed anymore. Now, several scholars have pointed out a problem with this account. As long as e umlaut remains a phonetic process, in the post-lexical phonology, it's not clear how it could survive the loss of its triggering context. So if you have underlying u as an uvel, why doesn't uvel just surface as uvel with no front rounding? The only way for e umlaut to persist is if for some reason it enters the lexical phonology while the front rounded allophones are still predictable allophones of U and O respect respectively. But now this account raises two questions. First, why does E umlaut enter the lexical phonology while its products are not contrastive? Now, Paul Kiparsky suggests that it's because the new front rounded allophones were perceptually more salient than their triggers which were becoming progressively weaker as time went on. I find this explanation to be quite compelling, but it raises another question. How do the products of E umlaut enter the lexical phonology when they involve non-contrastive features like round that originate in enhancement? To this question, contrastive hierarchy theory can contribute an old and new solution based on the notion of contrast shift. It's an old solution because in an article first published in 1931, Roman Jakobson proposed that diachronic phonology must look at contrast shifts. But it's also a new solution because Jakobson's program was never really carried out. But contrastive hierarchy theory gives us a well-defined way to look at contrast shifts. So let's revisit the stage when E umlaut was still uh, a, an enhancement, uh, a rule in the post-lexical enhancement component. Adapting Kiparsky's idea, I propose that the perceptual salience of the front rounded allophones caused learners to hypothesize that round is actually a contrastive feature. Now, of course, it was not part of the earlier West Germanic feature hierarchy, which just had low front and high. But we can construct another contrastive hierarchy that does include round. One such hierarchy is shown below. We can make a hierarchy front over round over high. This new hierarchy, however, requires demoting the feature low to make room for round. This is how contrastive hierarchies work. One can introduce or promote a feature, 
but there's a trade-off. Another feature has to be demoted. Hopefully not a feature that we need. So in the new feature hierarchy, the vowels are first divided into plus front, E-A, and minus front, U-O-A. Then round divides U-O from A. And finally, high completes the contrastive features. Now, when E umlaut changes the minus front plus round vowels U-O to become plus front, the result is new front rounded vowels, which begin as allophones. Here is what the derived tree looks like. The new front rounded vowels are not underlying, but they are still allophones of U and O. Although they are allophones though, they can arise in the contrastive phonology because they consist only of contrastive features. They are thus what Moulton is called deep allophones. He was referring to the old English voice fricatives, which also arise early in the contrastive or lexical phonology as allophones of the voiceless fricatives. Deep allophones are possible because contrastive features can be predictable in a hierarchical approach. Now we have left one, left hanging one important question that you might be wondering about. Recall the trade-off that this analysis requires. In the new hierarchy, ah no longer has a plus low feature. Uh-oh, do we now have a, oops, I need that problem. No, ah no longer needs a plus low feature. I know of no evidence in Old English, for example, that ah causes lowering of other segments or otherwise needs an active plus low feature. Recall that this is in striking contrast to earlier stages of the language where there is evidence that ah did cause lowering and needed a plus low feature. This type of connection between contrast and activity is exactly what contrastive hierarchy theory predicts. So to sum up, Contrastive hierarchy theory makes testable empirical predictions about phonological systems, provides interesting accounts of acquisition, and a new way of looking at phonological inventories. Of course, many questions remain to be explored. Some of them are, can the contrastivist hypothesis really be sustained? Or does the oops, I need that problem, that is the problem of too much activity, uh, does that arise. Conversely, what happens when there is too little activity? Uh, we might expect that phonetics uh, might play a larger role in determining the features in such a case, uh, as has been suggested by Krakowski. Are there constraints apart from contrast on what phonological features can be? How stable are contrastive hierarchies across time and place? This seems somewhat variable. And finally, the big question, how do learners acquire the feature hierarchy of their language? I've tried to show that the ideas that contrastive hierarchy theory are built on have a long and even distinguished pedigree in the history of phonology. For various reasons, this theory never quite came together in the 20th century. It's my hope that the full potential of this approach will be realized in the 21st. And uh, for discussion and ideas, uh, I would like to, th over the years, I'd like to thank uh, these people. And thank you for listening, uh, obrigado. Um, for more recent papers and talks, uh, please see my website, and this is my book on this subject. And here uh, I'm just showing you uh, that I have uh, references uh, I know you can't read them now, but maybe you, if you're interested, you can look them up later. And finally, thank you very much to uh, Brazil for providing this uh, great platform. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Elon, uh, for your talk, for the stimulating set of ideas. And uh, I believe I have some 
comments to relay, some questions to relay. I think I will start with the first one. There's a general round of thanks here in the chat window. <laughs> uh, no, the first question I see is from uh, Bill Itzardi, and it asks, what differences do you see between the contrastivist hypothesis and the notion of structure preservation or the strong domain hypothesis as it's called in lexical phonology? Ah, um, very interesting question, Bill. Thank you for the question. <laughs> um, well, well, they're different, right? Because uh, as in fact we've seen, um, you, the contrastivist hypothesis is consistent with non-structure preserving uh, processes just as we saw in, in uh, Old English, in Germanic, where we can create non-structure preserving uh, vowels, right? New vowels that have structures that are, are different from any underlying combination. However, they can arise in the contrastive phonology because they just use, they use only contrastive features. So I would say that um, contrastive hierarchy theory um, is, is allows for non-structure preserving. Of course, it also is compatible with structure preserving processes. So there are languages, for example, where um, you, know, you wouldn't be allowed to create uh, a new combination of con features, even if they're contrastive, and you would have to go to one of the existing kind of phonemes. Um, Sarah McKenzie, by the way, has uh, done quite a bit of work on um, uh, looking at um, structure preservation, uh, contrastive hierarchies in the context of stratal uh, OT uh, type uh, analysis. So um, that, that was what I would say about that. Uh, I should also add that actually the whole notion of structure preservation, in my view, has never really been uh, completely defined, uh, right? So, um, uh, I mean, there's more one could say about that, but um, I, I'd say the first thing is one would have to give a, a precise definition of what one means by it, uh, but I'm going by what people generally mean. And uh, yes, yeah, so we, we uh, a contrastive, uh, contrastivist hypothesis uh, allows for both uh, structure preserving and non-structure preserving. Thank you. Uh, we actually have another question here, uh, this time by Bill Itzardi. And this <laughs> one is, given the account for Old English, does this entail that in modern German, there's no plus low anymore? So that, I mean, the umlaut process for which you know the front version of a ah is a, ah, but is actually you know something like e. Eh. Uh, it's not plus low plus front, uh, specifically because the height of this is not defined. Yeah, well, that that would depend on what the analysis of modern German is. If if it's if if those are the vowels, I think it has more vowels than what I had <laughs> in, um, in in the, the talk. So. Um, I, I, don't, I won't venture an opinion on that, but um, uh, I'd say if, if it has um, vowels that are sort of similar to the ones I talked about and a feature hierarchy that's similar to the one I talked about, then um, that should follow. But um, there, there could be other things going on. Thank you. Uh, I have a question here from Michael Brinkerhoff which is as follows. Does contrastive hierarchy theory require the use of a specific feature theory? Or can you plug in anything, for example, uh, Hayes 1998 feature theory, Hall's feature theory in the Cambridge Handbook of Phonology? Ah, um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I would say in, you know, at its bare um, minimum, uh, contrastive hierarchy, Contrastive hierarchy theory just talks about contrast and you know primes, and uh, you could plug in um, other sorts of features. So you could have, um, for example, elements. I a few of the references I mentioned have talked about people who are doing basically contrastive hierarchies, but not with binary features, but with privative 
features or with uh, elements, you know, like an element theory. Um, although again, there's, um, well, we could talk about <laughs> um, element theory, but uh, in, in principle, you could plug those in. Um, there's other things though. So if you have a theory of features that has, uh, for example, like feature geometry or you know, that has built-in dependencies, uh, then I, th I think it gets complicated uh, because uh, then you know, you're sort of introducing extra baggage into, <laughs> into the uh, contrastive uh, tree, so to speak. So for example, supposing, um, su supposing you've got a, a theory of features that says that, um, I don't know, let's say feature lateral uh, has to be a dependent of um, you know, something like coronal, let's say. And uh, supposing that uh, the feature coronal is actually not contrastive or you don't need it to be contrastive, but you do need lateral. So by putting in lateral, if your theory says that, well, if you have lateral, you must have coronal, then you're forced to put in um, a non-contrastive feature to support the uh, contrastive one. Now, I think it's an empirical question. I mean, if, if that's the right theory of features, then okay, then you have to do it. But uh, I would like to start off assuming a, a kind of a no baggage uh, type of theory, whereby the only hierarchy you have is the contrastive one, and you don't superimpose on it other things like feature geometry or other kind of built-in dependencies. Um, Right, so uh, I mean, if again, if, if those are independently required, then fine, we have to modify the theory to accommodate them. But um, my, my first uh, guess would be to try and do without it. I wanted to perhaps uh, think about that question in light of some recent developments within the Brazilian Portuguese language vowel system and indeed in my own thoughts about them which is that Brazilian Portuguese doesn't have seven vowels, oral vowels, actually has eight. The eighth vowel is the one that's used for uh, borrowings of English, English carrot. So in ah. words like rush, ruffles, nuggets, pickup, duster, all of these, uh, you know, these are called loan word, but you know, they've been in the language for long enough now that I think that we, they can be considered. At what point does a loan word stop being, you know, a borrowing and, and is a real word of the language? And the vowel that's used for the adaptation of these, uh, it, for all of these in uh, nuggets or sway or rush or ruffles or, or is essentially the oral uh, version of the nasal vowel of the nasal ah. So oh. the nasal oh, isn't a nasal ah, but it's a nasal uh, as you had in your slides. It's a, it's a upside, ah, uh, it's oh, that higher. One. Yeah. Oral vowel that called in to fill in the gap that I would say is now an eighth oral vowel of Brazilian Portuguese is essentially just the oral version of that. Uh. Uh, so it's very interesting, I think, because it's a where we have the emergence of a new phoneme, mm -hmm. but the quality of that phoneme uh, I would say is influenced by it having been present in the in the right. nasal engine. And so just thinking about your prior comment, one was whether, you know, for that particular case, the size height specification of nasal uh was not necessary for purposes of contrast. But then given that it already had that height specification mm. when nasality was taken out of it, it's sort of cat. So it reminded me a bit of what you were just saying about, you know, it's important something that you necessarily need contrastively what happens. And I think in this particular case, having imported ah. the height specification of that nasal vowel kind of helps in understanding why once the nasal lost, that specific height in the body is kept. Yeah, that, <clears throat> well, again, uh, as, as um, came up in, in the talk about Germanic, um, Sometimes when you add a vowel, um, you don't need to change anything in the hierarchy if, if it fits into a, a slot you already had. But other times, 
adding a vowel requires you to make a new contrast or add a, a new, new feature or, and then where does it come from? And yeah, I think one common thing is to take a feature that's already sort of around, maybe even as an enhancement somewhere mm -hmm. else mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and recruit it. And mm -hmm. then it becomes a contrastive feature. Mm -hmm. that's used. Uh, yes, that, um, uh, I think that's a common thing that happens. Right, so keeping the non-redundant coronal in this case would be not a bug, but a feature, literally, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, right. <laughs> I'm looking in the chat here. There's a question by Deborah Ariel Farias that I don't, I don't understand the referent of, so I cannot really transmit and Deborah verify it. Um, Michael Brinkerhoff also adds, indeed, he was thinking about element as a potential uh, plugin of contrastive hierarchy theory. Indeed, one is reminded of Saussure's uh, often claim that it didn't matter at all about the values of the specific uh, phonemes, only their oppositions in the system that you could paint all of the chess pieces blue and green and they would still function as chess pieces. Uh, yeah. And I guess to that point, Elon, uh, I just was distracted by the chat there, sorry. Uh, to that point, yeah, I wonder if you could just say a bit more about the uh, substance-free debate, given that in a sense you've positioned yourself as a Saussure saying, you know, it doesn't really matter the values of some of these as the, the hierarchy cuts them into their own respective cells, uh, given also thoughts about sign language, you know, what's the extent to which one is substance-free or thinks that there still might be something like the contrastive hierarchy, but some necessary substantive soup on which it must rest? Yes, uh, uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, so, I mean, just to say where I stand on the substance-free debate, I, I would say I don't know because uh, I, someone would have to tell me what exactly substance-free position is or anti-substance-free position is. Um, what I could tell you is, yes, I agree, first of all, that uh, the sign Sign uh, phonology is very important here because uh, I think cognitively, whatever's going on at some level with uh, phonology of spoken language is also going on in sign language. So Absolutely. we've got to have some level of uh, abstractness uh, whereby um, they kind of uh, are the same. And, and I think, again, contrastive hierarchy is, is uh, well suited to uh, function at, at that level. Uh, yeah, however, once, one, once you have a modality though, uh, I don't assume that the feature, so I assume the task of language learners is to you know, come up with the contrast of features in their language, but I assume in the normal case, they will try to associate those features with phonetic substance. So these aren't just, you know, feature one, feature two, feature three, or triangle, square, circle, or you know, something like that. Um, but that in the normal case, um, if, if you find a, that certain class of segments has to um, go together with respect to some feature, you don't stop there, but you have to come up with some hypothesis, what is that feature? And that feature, in, in spoken uh, mode will be uh, some sort of phonetic um, um, features, uh, phonetic uh, substance. Uh, in a sign language, it'll be uh, in a different uh, in a manual uh, mode, um, but you have to come up with, with something. So in that, I mean, this used to be called a fully abstract phonology, you know, that phonology is just, um, works on abstract symbols and phonetics is completely separate. I, I don't agree with that. I think that um, in the norm, in the usual case, uh, when you come up with features, you have to try and, and associate them with some substance. Now, I'm, it doesn't mean there might not arise uh, what they call you know, crazy rules or crazy cases where you've got to put together segments that you just, there is just no phonetic correlate whatsoever for that. Um, and then, you know, maybe uh, phonology has the means to somehow deal with that. Uh, but 
you know, these are not common and I don't think they're long lasting. Uh, and um, so I, I don't think that's the usual case. So I think at some point substance has to get attached to, to um, these contrastive features that you come up with. Um, but, you know, I, I wouldn't say though that the, well, I've written that the features are, are not universal themselves. So the feature theory is, is universal. You have contrastive hierarchy is, is universal. It's built in. You don't have to learn to, that you need a contrastive hierarchy, but you have to learn what the hierarchy is and what features you can plug in there. Now I put at the end of my talk, uh, one of my questions, open questions is, are there constraints on what features can be uh, beyond just contrast? And uh, actually uh, I've been talking since Bill was uh, listening. Uh, I was talking to Bill at Sardi uh, about this. Uh, so he pointed out, for example, you can't just make up any kind of feature you want. Like we don't have like picket fence features where you know uh, you you take say an E and a and you take points from all over the vowel space and say okay I'm going to make a feature out of that. Um, so I, I think there's probably some some further built-in constraints on yeah. what sort of features you can come up with. But I was struck by you showing actually the old Germanic system by the fact that it had only one backgrounded vowel uh, because that system is so common in the languages of uh, lowlands, South America, that you'll have either only U or only O, but, you know, having both seems to be quite rare among, you know, Tupige South American lowlands languages. And one wonders whether this has something to do with that old, you know, question about the trapezoidal shape of the vowel space or, or, or what, but it tends to be, you know, a fragile contrast that then can split off in various ways. And I was struck by the parallel with, with Germanic there. I wondered actually on your last slide, you also mentioned this work that I was not familiar with by Krakowski on Kowski. whether phonetics takes over yes. in certain cases. And he you can has say a bit more about that. I recommend he has a University of Toronto dissertation. It's in, in the references. You can get it on the web from University of Toronto. They have all the dissertations up. It, it's uh, on uh, languages that descend from Middle Chinese and uh, the tone systems. And uh, I think it's quite fascinating. So what he shows is that languages that have extensive uh, tone sundi, uh, lots of tone sundi rules, the, um, there, there's generally four features. The contrastive structure of the features, sort of the feature trees um, mirror very closely the middle Chinese tones. Uh, okay. That is, despite uh, lots of changes in the surface phonetics, um, nevertheless, the relations between the tones remains the same. Um, however, there's uh, one language, Tianjin, where apparently the tones drifted so far, the phonetics of the tones drifted so far from what the original contrastive structure was, that at some point learners just did not continue the old system because there was a much simpler way to reorganize the tones. And then they developed new types of tone sundi that mirror that new system. Uh, but then what he showed was in, there are languages like uh, Cantonese and uh, those, those languages where they don't have much tone sundi. And there uh, he said the phonetics of the tone seemed more stable and the hypothesis is that well, that's mainly what they have to go on. Uh, so if you don't have like lots of Sunday rules and alternations and stuff telling you about like that sort of activity, phonological activity, then you rely maybe more on the phonetics of the tones. And um, uh, so that, that's, uh, that's his, um, uh, what he, he showed in this. I'd like to see that. And I wondered the extent to which he may involve enhancement in that picture because you know, the Mandarin oh. third tone arguably has a great deal of enhancement in it. And if you take away the enhancing portion, it's easier to explain what goes on with Sunday. 
Yeah, well, he, he stripped away all the, the enhancement and the, the, the complications. So um, he's just talking about contrastive features. Um, but um, yeah, you might be uh, interested in that. Thank you. I think that relates to a more general question about whether you'll make these slides available on your website. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, um, um, I'd be happy to do that. Um, OK, great. I will tell everyone that. Uh, I'm just going to see if there are other questions that are uh, percolating up from the ether. <laughs> Well, it doesn't look like there are. So um, at this point, I will thank you, Elon, for your participation, for your dedication to uh, even uh, contextualizing this within the context of Brazilian Portuguese uh, with the that you brought forward. And I know the connection to Graziella's work. Graziella's here watching, and uh, I'm sure very uh, gratified to see the connection <laughs> with uh, the different orders of acquisition. So. Uh, we thank you very much on behalf of Abralin. I enjoyed this very much, and I'm sure that having your slides on the web will lead to uh, much further thought and discussion. Great, thank you very much, and thanks for, for uh, being the moderator. Oh, sure, my pleasure. Okay, bye everyone, signing off for now. Bye. Bye. <laughs>